Welcome everyone to our uh, first webinar in a while. I'm really, really happy to have uh, David and Anne here to speak uh, about their book, which is coming out next week, I believe. Um, I was able to get a, uh, <laughs> a pre-release copy. I, I was happy to be at a conference in Kentucky where David was speaking and I just wandered through and there was the book and there he was. And, and so I got a copy, I got a chance to read it. Um, it's wonderful, it's full, it's deep, it's thorough. Um, the 100 pages of citations I, I, I hear are not in the book because it's literally 100 pages of citations. Um, so just to the, to, the, to the point of drawing the connections between soil health, plant health, food quality, human health, and that is such a complicated thing to do. Um, you know, and one of the reasons that scientists can't say they're connected or how we can connect them um, is because it's really a complicated thing. And so this is just a lot of really valuable work they've done over the past, is it four years now you've been working on this project? Five, five years, okay. Yeah, a real labor of love, um, um, I, I hope, <laughs> I think <laughs> it comes across well, um, but really uh, just, a, it's really thorough and works through um, step-by-step in a really, in a, in a way that's also accessible. Um, plenty of things I learned. Um, maybe if you each would like to give a quick background of yourself and maybe something about the previous books you've done so that we have this in context um, before we get into other questions. That's good. Go for it. All right. Well, I'm Dave and uh, this is uh, What Your Food Aid is the fourth book I've written that has or helped to write that has uh, a focus on soils. And I'm a geologist by background and training. So I got into thinking about soils and their importance for human societies, really through looking about what happens when we degrade or lose them. So just looking at the downside of how people have treated land over, over centuries and how that has affected human societies. And that was a book called Dirt, the Erosion of Civilizations that came out a while ago um, and delved into how the way past societies treated their land affected their descendants. And set the stage for the rise and fall of civilizations throughout the post-glacial world that we know as the human world today. Um, and that that book was- uh, That was a lot you just said that one sentence, but yes, keep going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that, that book, um, I was finishing uh, writing about sort of the, the, the sad story, the destruction of land throughout ages when we bought a house in North Seattle. And Anne, as she'll tell you, is a biologist and a major league gardener. And she restored fertility to our yard in the house that we bought in a way that went completely against what I was writing about and writing about dirt. And it was really eye-opening and interesting. And she and I got very interested in, well, how did this work? How could composting and mulching and gardening activities really bring soil back to life remarkably rapidly? And we wrote about that in The Hidden Half of Nature, about the role of, of uh, microbes, bacteria and fungi in, in supporting the health of soil and the parallels between what happens in the human gut and what happens um, around the roots of plant systems. Um, and you know, seeing how that rapidly she could restore soil, the soil in our yard led to questions of, you know, could this be done on farms? Could it be done on commercially viable, sustainable, pro productive, profitable farms? And that led to writing Growing a Revolution, uh, which interviewed regenerative farmers around the world and looked at the principles underlying it why it actually works and how it works and how to pull it off. And that left the question that we were both curious about, about what is the implications of rebuilding soil fertility on human health? What, if any, are the connections between soil health and human health? And the new book, What's Your Food Aid, is really our, our attempt to dig into that literature, look at all the connections, because it's really complicated. I mean, you're just thinking about all the things that influence health before you even think about the soil is complicated enough. There's our genes, our, you know, our diet, you know, what we choose to eat, whether we get any exercise or not. Um, but we wanted to add to that mix how our food is grown and to investigate the degree to which those connections can be drawn from how we treat the soil to how the soil influences, how the health of the soil influences the health of crops how the health of the soil and health of, of what they eat influences the health of livestock and how it all cascades up to potentially influence human health. Um, then I'll turn it over to Anne, let her introduce herself yeah. um, and where we're at. Yeah. Uh, let's see. I, I, I think, uh, I don't know, Dave, Dave kind of covered it there. So my lens and perspective on things is to consider the biology that is kind of behind everything. And 
the found it's really the foundation for soil health as well and uh, i mean when we think about this trilogy of books you know dirt the hidden half growing a revolution and now what your food ate i sometimes think oh we should have started with this book <laughs> but we didn't we didn't know all this stuff dan um back when dave wrote dirt and i was you know out in the garden playing in the dirt and so on and it it it's sort of you know it's sort of like this process where you have to kind of go through it and then you're you're prepped and you're ready to sort of oh okay now we have the pieces now we have the knowledge and the understanding and so i'd say what your food ate really it is really and truly an outgrowth of everything that we've you know written on and and thought about and we chose um you've seen you've you know you have the book um for audience members out there we wanted to organize it in a way that was sort of an homage to how some of um the great organic gardeners and icons yeah. in organic agriculture and other systems of agriculture thought about things. So we've organized it into um, four basic sections, soil, the plants, the animals, and the people. And that, um, and running through each of those, you know, near and dear to my heart is um, in part the biology that allows soil health to be created um, to maintain, to, to be able to maintain it. And I've been thinking a lot. Sometimes it, 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 uh, it's after you write a book that you begin to realize, oh, this is, you, you, you sort of get to the very inner part of the onion, so to speak. Yeah. And um, I forget who we were talking with earlier in the week, but it, it, the book makes me think about how um, about nested relationships between people and our planet kind of writ large and that sort of the biggest one of the biggest uh, linkages there is our, our interactions with the soil and everything that comes from the soil. So it to me, this book is. Um, I don't know, it sort of tries to encapsulate everything, uh, how we as a species are treating our planet, how there's so much potential to be addressing um, health problems through agricultural practices and policy. Um, that's another, um, another part of the book. And uh, I guess I'll just, you know, leave it at that. I mean, there's, there's other themes and topics nested within each of those four sections that i'm sure we'll we'll uh we'll get to during the yeah day. well just a couple couple thoughts i mean one you know i um you know it is lydia e. balfour for instance you know i've known her name you know I, I, apparently she died before after i was born so theoretically we our lives overlapped on the physical plane i thought she was just sort of on the pantheon somewhere and didn't really know details and i was like oh my god I just love the the little bits you did about all the different people and like you said, homage and you know, um, it's it's really it's keeping it personal but telling this deeper story. So, you know, I'm just to stand back and just to reiterate what I think you're saying. You know, this is a it's a logical continuation from, you know, humans civilization destroys the planet to oh, doesn't have to be actually. There's other cultures that have shown that humans and civilization don't destroy the planet. And it's biology is that symbiosis. It's like life is the actual thing. When we realize we're working with life, then, then we actually have the, the way out of the box, right? Out of that reductionist sort of framework, that colonized paradigm, whatever you want to call it. So that's book number two. Book number three is like, okay, conceptually, this is possible. Now, is it being done in a, in a way that would be recognized in this Western world of farmers and machinery and you know grocery stores and things like that? Okay, yes, it can be done. And now you're sort of like, you know, weaving it all together. So it, as I was saying to Dave a couple of weeks ago, when we were in person together, it really feels like this is like a box set for, for someone to come into this deeper conversation and be walked through the logical sort of like, where do we sit 
with this understanding that, you know, quote unquote, the, you know, we're destroying the planet and climate change is upon us. And, you know, it's, it's the effect of humans on the landscape, but that's, that's just all there is. Like that's sort of your, that's your baseline understanding. And it's just a really gen gentle, but solid and continuous walk through of actually something entirely different is here. And, you know, it's not just about the environment, it's about your health too, and your children's health, which I think is the most visceral thing for a lot of us. The well being of others out there, you know, if you've got enough energy and compassion, great, you know, do something about it. But really, I care about myself and my, and my kids. Um, so, yeah, I mean, maybe just are there some central thematic sort of points that, that you think would be appropriate to convey as far as those four sections of soil? Can you just walk us through for a few minutes some of the key insights you got from it? Is that possible? Yeah, sure. I mean, and, you know, and, and the, the new book is essentially a standalone one. It's sort of like, you know, the, the is, Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit, you know, you can read them in yeah. whichever order and it makes sense. Um, <laughs> sort of. Yeah, so, <laughs> well, they do. Um, but they the, all stand alone, but, but, but yeah, yeah. Uh, but there is a logic you know, if, to, the, to the flow and, and the order that we wrote them yeah. in because it frankly yeah. reflects our learning about this. Um, yeah. It's there's, there's very few people who have, you know, sort of deep expertise in both you know the earth sciences the biological sciences the agronomic sciences and the medical sciences and, yeah. and we don't claim to have expertise in all four of those areas but there's a lot of work out there that other people have done that can be read and put together and, and so these these books are essentially our synthesis of sort of existing knowledge and trying to update some of the knowledge that you know people like lady Eve balfour had great insights back yeah. in the 1930s and 40s and rodale and and and, and sir Albert yeah. howard and so on um but science has come a long way in the last century and what we were very impressed by in this you know this journey of discovery and through writing these books was how much of that new science really supports the, the, the gross view, the, the framework within which some of the early pioneers of organic agriculture were working, how they were seeing the world. Of course, the details are different. They didn't know much about microbes and, and sort of the symbiotic relationships between fungi and plants. There were suspicions of it and assertions of it in cases, but the science was, was fairly cryptic at that point. Uh, and a lot of what's come since then has really illuminated those connections. So when we look at trying to trace that causal you know, the, the causal linkages from what, how we described in the book of how, how rocks become us, um, you know, how, the, uh, how we get our nutrients from the earth. Um, life is the, is the key driving force, the catalyst that really helps propel that along. So when you look at that first connection of how the way we farm affects the health of the soil, you're really looking at things like tillage. You're looking at like the over application of synthetic fertilizers. Uh, you're looking at uh, pesticides, herbicides and insecticides and how all that affects life in the soil. Um, and so we go into each of those connections um, and the, the sort of pillar, not pillar, the, the iconic practices of what modern conventional agriculture of a lot of tillage, a lot of fertilizer and a lot of pesticides all turn out to influence soil health in negative ways um, and over different time scales. I wrote about in dirt how just plowing can degrade the land over centuries if it's maintained, even if you're doing cover crops and even if you're doing some other traditional practices to help maintain fertility. If you're always disturbing the soil, you're burning up organic matter and eventually it catches up with you. Um, in terms of fertilizers, it, it turns out that, of course, you know, nitrogen is nitrogen. It's an element, not an evil. <laughs> But the, the, the form that it's applied in, whether it's you know, liberally available and very soluble um, and how much of it there is relative to the needs of plants can actually very much affect the way that plants partner with, so with life in the soil. Um, there, it turns out there's two gene pathways, for example, for, for plants in terms of how to sort of take up um, uh, mineral elements from the soil. And in a very nitrogen rich environment, uh, they don't engage as much in fungal partner in partnerships with fungal yeah. organisms, which are the things that get mineral micronutrients like zinc and copper, which you don't need a lot of to grow high yields, but what we need in our bodies to maintain our health. So we want them in our crops. And those are the kind of connections that we wrote about in the soil section of the book in terms of how agronomic practices influence uh, the provisioning of mineral micronutrients to plants. Uh, how it affects their production of phytochemicals, things that are antioxidants and anti-inflammatories that are, you know, typically uh, higher in fruits and vegetables, but there are there are amounts of in grains when we don't breed them out and we don't farm them conventionally. Um, 
And so just those are some of the basic connections that we looked at in the soil section. And Anne, do you want to do the, the plant and the animal sections or the? Yeah, I can, I can hit on some things. Um, what your question kind of makes me think of, Dan, is um, just talking maybe a little bit about some of the sort of higher order themes or topics yeah. that are in the book that we try and yeah. identify because it's not the way in which we, I mean, this group might, this audience will probably get it, but, but we're not the mainstream. <laughs> But we're trying to get to be the mainstream, right? So this is the way you do it is by telling a story and doing it well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. And one thing that has struck me in you know all the research that we've done in sort of the biomedical literature, um, you come across a term a lot in public health and medicine, and that term is um, evidence based. And the context for that is, you know, we need that treatment to be evidence based, but, you know, because otherwise we're not going to do it. You know, yeah. you go back to, you know, the uh, 16th or 17th century, say, and treatments for smallpox, for example, they were not evident. They were not evidence based um, <laughs> until Edward Jenner got involved with the cowpox story there. So I got to thinking about the evidence base. Um, in agriculture and really the things that Dave just mentioned, the tillage and the over application of synthetic fertilizers and loads and loads of pesticides. Um, we know that those, the evidence that we have about how the soil microbiome works and how plants, um, plant physiology and plant biology work, the evidence is that doing those kinds of practices really are not good for the soil they're not good for the plant can you get a plant to grow through those practices you bet we've been doing that for decades in modern but there's plenty of evidence to show it's actually counterproductive yeah. all these things that a lot of us already say about tillage and fertilizer and things like that there's plenty of evidence to bear to back that up what you're trying to tell us yeah right it yeah. is actually well shown to be counterproductive that's yeah. right <laughs> and so sort of the real evidence base in agriculture i think we should we need to start looking at the soil soil health and how soil is supposed to function under you know I'll I'll call it normal circumstances which is to say feeding the life of the soil with organic matter whether that's the physical remains of plants or whether that's the exudates that flow out of you know the plant body to feed the microbiome there there is now ample evidence and there has been for quite some time that this is what makes soil biology work and work normally and work the way in which it is supposed to. So that's part of the evidence base uh, that we go into in you know, the chapter on, on crops and plants and, and soil and, and looking at this. Because we, you know, we know for sure that uh, the relationship, the symbioses that go on between plants and soil is one of the oldest and grandest symbioses in the entire you know history of life so that to me is a big piece of evidence that we ought to be paying attention to you know in our agricultural systems so that's, just, that's just, just, so before you move on that's a critical point from an evolutionary biology perspective the microbes evolved the plants right i mean you cover that this is something that you know i'm like yeah we all know this but actually you know, it's really, it's, it's written down in a way that you can actually understand. And it's just, a, it's a really important piece of this puzzle, that, that, that whole relationship, right? I mean, and, and, when and I'm sorry for the background noise. We've got a thunderstorm coming through. So I'm um, no problem. trying to monitor the dynamics, but I'm maintaining, maintaining a connection. So no, I'll no, keep meeting we'll, myself. We'll have seaplanes and helicopters occasionally fly by the window here. So. <laughs> okay. um, but yeah, that, that connection uh, between soil life and plant life and the mutual dependence uh, and the, the, the dependencies that they have evolved really can be traced right back to land plants colonizing the continents. Some of the oldest land plant fossils we have have fungal connections tied up in their roots that was part of, you know, it's a deep part of the evolutionary relationship. How many hundred million years ago? I mean, well, it's like 400, 450 million years ago. It's so when first, ago, even for the geology. first land plants, the first plants that they weren't like floating, you know, phytoplankton in the in the water, 
the first land plants only were able to um, do their plantness based on the fact that they had fungi there digesting the soil for them, right? They wouldn't, plants wouldn't exist from an evolutionary perspective without the bacteria and the fungi. Yeah, that, like it's a really, really important point. Yeah, it's That really we don't understand important. and we think about, I'm just, I'm just fertilizing, I'm just whatever, no. If you don't create a dynamic where their gut flora functions well, yeah, you can basically think you can expect of, things to function well. You can yeah. think of the soil and the life in the soil as the gut of a plant, where you know we have our own internal microbiome uh, that helps us digest things and creates metabolites that are beneficial for our health. But uh, plants have it sort of sort of turned around backwards and inside out relative to us, or probably more accurately, we, we're inside out from them. <laughs> um, I say plants have an external digestive tract, and we have an internal digestive tract. Yeah, but if you look exactly at the work right. of James White, a lot of it's internal. Yeah, it's exa exactly right, and that the um, you know those partnerships have evolved and are fairly specialized, so that certain plants will try and actively recruit different microbes for their external stomach in the soil, um, and fostering those relationships turns out to be a real key to building soil health in agronomic practices. And that in turn influences the provisioning of things in our crops and in our livestock that actually then go on to influence human health when they get uh, uh, you know, ingested in, uh, in the human diet. And one of the things that you know, inadvertently happened in the late 20th century with the rise of uh, the Green Revolution and the whole sort of agricultural uh, um, reshaping of the second half of the 20th century was that we focused and the, the we sort of, you know, agronomy, uh, agriculture as a human enterprise focused on high yields of provisioning lots of calories for people. And we kind of took our eye off the ball in terms of what that meant for the nutritional quality of food. And there's different genes and different pathways that influence those things. And you know, there's been a lot of reports of declines of mineral nutrients and, and vitamins and, and let fewer reports, but I think perhaps even more important declines in things like phytochemicals in crops over the last century. And a lot of that has to do with sort of just prioritizing in our agronomic research, yield, yield, yield. Um, and there's nothing wrong with feeding the world, right? There's nothing wrong with high yields of crops. But the case Anne and I make in the book is that we need to now start shifting into thinking about being able to produce high yields of, high, of more nutritious crops, going for both quality and quantity. And that's looking at, you know, things like you look at with the Bionutrient Association in terms of the variability of the levels of nutrients and micronutrients in crops. Um, it's, a, it's a huge issue. Um, and what we're kind of arguing in the book is that it's an, opp it's an opportunity we kind of missed over the last century, but it's the opportunity of the moment to try and actually turn that around and reinvest in the life in the soil, rebuild the life in the soil to get that cascading effect and what it means for crop health, livestock and health and human health in terms of the kind of compounds in our foods that can help us mitigate or manage particularly chronic diseases. Yeah. And one of the things that we want folks to understand by the time they get to the book that much of the way that the nutritional world, it, well, really sort of any discipline the way they talk about nutrients is really kind of limited, um, right? Because it's the it's the it's the fats, the proteins, and the carbohydrates, and all of the wars and battles that have ensued around those um, basic nutrients that fuel simplistic, our simplistic definitions, right? Yeah, and it's we just really so, the buckets are so big you can't really say anything, right? Yeah, and the and, context is not there. Yeah. Right. And, you know, the thing about where the where that way of thinking came from was during times when the human population didn't have enough to eat. And so people didn't have enough calories. So the focus was really on calories and how to make sure that uh, the human diet had enough calories. And we measure calories, you know, fats, proteins, carbohydrates. We don't really talk about the non-caloric parts of the human diet and why they are important. And one of the things that the, the research that we did for this book really impressed upon me is we don't really even have, you know, the entire grasp on all of these molecules and compounds that come into our bodies via 
the plants and animals in the human diet. And, and this is why in part farming practices matter so much because some of these molecules and compounds um, are metabolites made in the soil that by the microbiome that the plant can take in. And so, you know, right away, my brain goes to, well, but what if those microbes aren't present in the soil or they're present, but they're in different community relationships and those beneficial compounds and molecules are, are kind of, their production is being scuttled. And yeah. so that, that means they're not in our crops. And if they're not in our, our crops, then they're not, you know, in the animals that are eating those crops or the people that are eating those crops. And so that's where um, this is really important because a lot of these molecules and compounds, they're not necessary per se for um, sort of fueling the growth that, that happens, you know, when you go from two cells to trillions of cells. That's what calories do. Calories yeah. fuel that kind of growth. But of course, by young adulthood, we're all hopefully as large as we're going to get <laughs> and not too much larger. No. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so the question becomes, how, how do our bodies, what is human biology about then in terms of taking care of all that biomass that the caloric um, you know, fuel, so to speak, grew? And that's where many of these other things come in. And, and it's, it's things like, um, there's a researcher at a children's hospital in Oakland, a, a group there that looks at these things. And it's kind of a bad name, but you, know, you can go read their papers and learn more about it. They're sort of clumped under this whole group of things called longevity vitamins. Okay, and I need to say right away, they're not even vitamins. That was just the name that the person who came up with this concept gave them. It's um, one of these compounds, I'm sure you've heard of it, is ergothionine. So this is an amino acid, actually, and it's made by soil microbes. And so what if our soils, though, that we're growing our crops in are, you know, low in numbers of microbes? What's, what's going on with the ergothionine? And ergothionine is important for our health because as we age, Cells and tissues, man, they're, they're hardworking and they're constantly needing, it's, I, you know, here's the analogy, you know, an old, house, today's day and age. Yeah. An old <laughs> house needs a lot of maintenance, but if you have all the tools, you know, and you have all the right paints and all the right stuff, you just keep maintaining things and it can go on and on and on. Yeah. It's probably like, you know, the car people that are out there, someone's got like a pristine cherry, you know, um, uh, Model T, and it's still running, you know, really, really, really good. And that's partly because of the maintenance and the tools and everything that goes into that. So that's what this whole group of things, ergothionine is one of them. There's there's others we, talk, we write about in the book. They're all about uh, just sort of maintaining the functioning of our cells and tissues. And, and you know, a carbohydrate doesn't really do that. Yeah. <laughs> but this is where phytochemicals are important. Vitamins yeah. are important, and um, particular kinds of minerals are important. So none of those things really have, fats are super important there too. They're the only one of the so-called longevity vitamins that really has any calorie content. And, and we, don't, we don't talk about the human diet enough in these terms. And part of it is that uh, there's standards, there's nutritional standards for how many calories each of us should have and what proportion yeah. it should be. But the thing when it comes to phytochemicals and um, some of, you know, ergothionine and so on, we don't really know what, what is the standard intake. And the fact is, is that stuff, it's variable. It's variable depending on your gender, where you are in your life history, um, what maybe your genomic vulnerabilities are. So that makes it hard to put into some USDA database. And, and that has led me to think about diet and what's in our foods in a whole different sort of way. And that is that given our genomic variability in each and every one of us, the variability in our microbiome, the variability in the food that we're eating, I think this is where the roots of omnivory in the human diet really shine because 
Mm. The more diverse we're eating across plant and animal foods, um, the more likely it is that we're going to be bringing these different compounds, molecules, and the, the standard classic nutrients into our bodies. And then depending on, you know, genome and microbiome, you sort of have set the foundation for your health. Yeah. And so you sort of, as I was telling someone earlier in the week, you set the foundation, you make it solid, you make it robust, and then you let it rip. That's, that's really kind of how. It should how take it care of itself, right? Your body should take care of itself if you just provide it the basic things it needs. Um, that's the whole point. I mean, we didn't, <laughs> we have a multi-trillion dollar medical industry uh, 100 years ago or 200 years ago. Um, not that there weren't things that needed to be addressed, but I think, didn't you make a point in your book about, about chronic illness versus this, you know, the sort of the diseases of, of pathogenicity and the pathogenicity has been addressed, but the chronic illness is just like shooting off the, off the charts. I think it's a really important point to think about, you know, the side panel and the, you know, how many, how many nutrients quote unquote are on the side panel? Is it nine or 10 or 11 or something? And how many does the USDA monitor in crops? Maybe it's a hundred say it's 150 to be generous and how many nutrients are there in food you know i was just talking to somebody who's deep down this metabolomics rabbit hole and he said there's about a hundred thousand compounds in food that have been um published upon like someone's written a paper about them so if the usda is monitoring 150 that means that there's 99,000 <laughs> 850 other compounds that have been proven in the literature exist that aren't being monitored but then he said, we're actually going down the rabbit hole and finding things that aren't published upon yet. And we've looked at a few different types of foods. We found about a million and a half compounds and we project that there's probably about 10 million compounds in food. Um, and I'm like, okay, so it's kind of like the microbes in the soil. Like we don't really know even names of 95% of them. It's kind of like the you know dark matter and, and, and matter, right? Like 95% of reality is not where we can find it. We, we have no way of with our scientific instruments naming it. So you know, there's one way to go to the rabbit hole, which is to say, we need to understand everything. And I would argue that's a fool's errand. I guess anybody can choose to do what they wish to do. But what I, I think, you know, there's this intuitive perspective, the indigenous perspective, whatever you want to call it, that sort of like, you know, what did Michael Pollan say? If your grandmother wouldn't recognize it, it's not food, right? There's junk and there's food as a continuum. And, you know, and what you guys said in the book about whole wheat versus versus um, you know, white, white flour, like a bunch of the nutrients in wheat are in the germ or are sorry, in the, in the brand. And when you take what may have been a well-raised, you know, wheat plant with good levels of nutrients in it, and you turn it into white flour, you just removed some vast majority of those nutrients. So it's not just about the, how it's raised. It's also about all the steps between there and, and ingesting it. But I, I like, I like what you're saying. And about like the um, evidence-based thing, because I think we, we've struggled with this for, for years. Like it sure looks like it's all connected, but we don't have a grand unified theory published paper, which connects it all. And part of what you've done, it sounds like is just get lost in the weeds of the literature and say on any one of these topics, on any one of these pieces of the connection, it sure looks like there's a lot of circumstantial evidence that says this is the way it works. And so, you know, we can, some of us, you know, make statements about destruction of, of soil microbiome and keeping minimal tillage and soil cover and polycultures. And we've got really most of the conclusions that this literature is showing, I think, already realized. Um, but it's really good to I feel like, you know, I'm, I haven't seen the 100 page citation list yet, but, um, you know, to really sort of be able to stand categorically on the Western rational scientific evidence and say, these things are actually totally connected. Like the most logical conclusion is that this is the way things are. And, and arguments that are sort of pushing back against that, we can really stand and say, look, we've got science on our side, actually. You're speaking from a certain level of, of you know, lack of perspective. So, Maybe I'm taking it wrong or adding something to it, but no, no, I, I, think, I, I think you've got it. What we tried to do in the book is to basically, you know, take the that 
convoluted path from the soil to human health. Break it into those bits of how does soil health affect plant health, how does plant health affect animal health, how do the two affect human health, um, and break it into essentially little pieces where there is solid science on each of the connections and then string those together like beads in a string and go, oh, if you can connect all the beads, you can get from one end of the necklace to the other end in a way that makes sense. What, what is very difficult, though, I think, and will always be difficult, is to be able to make very sort of simple, crisp predictions of, you know, if we do this one agronomic process to this one crop, how is that going to show up in the health of the U.S. population? I mean, th right. those dots are not going to be easy to connect. Because it's a multi-factor system, you should never expect that to be something right. that right. Right. you arrive right. at. Anybody so, who's asking for a silver bullet is missing the point. Right. And, and for understanding the full breadth of the connections, you know, we're not going to be there. But I think that the what we can do is understand the mechanisms and the, the why behind the thinking that these connections make sense to at least get a sense of directionality. You know, what would make for healthier food? I think we can answer that, um, you know, in terms of what would actually be you know, the number of, say, cancers prevented, if we, if everyone and if every farmer in the world went to regenerative agriculture, you know, could we, you know, stop cancer in its tracks? We're not gonna be able to answer that. And I don't think we could, because there's so many other things that actually influence our health as well. The chemicals in our environment, our diet, our genes, um, you know, there's a lot other than how we grow our food, including, as you were saying, you know, what we eat, uh, how we process it is huge. Um, yeah. And you know, in terms of the simplest advice, I think that we could give based on the research we did in this book, at, at the risk of Anne contradicting me and correcting me in a moment, would be you know to Still eat feel free to. <laughs> Don't worry. Yeah. You know, a diet of you know of, of 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 fresh whole foods grown in healthy soil is probably the best diet one could recommend. Um, you know, and you could add animal products with that or not, depending on what you choose to eat. Um, we go through a whole section of the book in terms of how what we feed our animals actually impacts the quality Massive. of the food we in turn get. It was get. great that piece on the, on the cows you did. That was really, really illuminating. Yeah, it was great. It was great. Oh, yeah. good. Yeah. <laughs> and, and to Dave's point and kind of what you're getting at too, Dan, um, we really love reductionist science, the, the royal we, people, human beings. The brain likes it black and white. We like to know definitively yes or definitively no about things. And, and yet, certainly anytime you get into uh, ecological relationships or cellular or molecular biology, it just isn't that way because life is incredibly situational and contextual and dynamic. It's, it's, um, it's not a stable, static, it's always this way kind of thing. And yeah. so going back to, um, you know, somebody who might say, well, I, I'm not sure I the skeptics out there. I'm not really sure I buy all this stuff about soil health and linkages to human health. And, and if you take it, if, you know, I'll, I'll go a, a little reductionist here because the, the power of reductionist science is that it allows us to um, explain things, right? We know we know this is so because of, of how it works. And so the yeah. reason soil health is linked um, to human health is that we know that microbes in the soil influence the kinds of things that end up in plants. And not only that, it influences, I'll call it a plant's behavior around yeah. defensive compounds that that plant produces based on interactions with soil microbiota. Okay, so farming practices are affecting soil biota. So this is affecting what's ending up in a plant body. And we know that in animals, mammals, whether, you know, a cow or a human, that our biology is reliant on having um, for optimal health a particular balance of fats, say, if you're a human being with regard to yeah. omega-3s and omega-6s. If you're a ruminant, if you're a cow, a goat, or a sheep, your, your digestive tract is sort of this walking compost heap, <laughs> I will say. The front end, the front end of, of uh, the digestive tract is its own microbiome 
and it does poorly on um, things like grains and seeds. These yeah. microbiota are all about fermentation. And so uh, a, a cow that's eating living plants that are rich in cellulose and fiber that's what the microbiota wants to get a hold of and start fermenting. And, and that influences what ends up in animal products and in, in particular, the fat profile. And we know enough about omega-6 and omega-3 fats in the human diet and how they've changed over time that the richness of the human diet with respect to omega-6 fats now is creating all manner of problems for us. Part of that has to do with the human um, inflammatory response and how fats figure into inflammation. Yeah. And, and there's a, a way more um, on that in the book. And so you have all these little pieces of sort of reductionist biology and science that tell us about the evidence and the way in which soil, plants, animals, and people work. And at every turn, you can ask the question, how does farming affect that? And how does farming affect that? And how does farming affect that? And pretty soon you can synthesize what these connections are. And, yeah. and so that's really what we're doing. Um, that's really what, what we're doing in the book is we're telling the story of how all of this stuff is connected. And it, it's, it's not some outlandish idea that the way in which we farm um, affects the plants and animals in our diet. We know they do. And so that's the sort of, that's the level I think that we need to, to be thinking about. Um, yeah, well, it's, you know, it's like the, the left brain and the right brain talk to each other, you know, the science and intuition, is there, is there a spot, is there a Vesica Pisces in the middle where those circles overlap? I think, you know, a lot of us have some deep consciousness or knowing or, or sort of intuition that that you know <laughs> these things do overlap and it seems like that's what you've done to some decent degree you've said these things that are sort of common sense and and well proven over time are verified you know categorically in the science as well and it's not about this or that it's about this and that and so no i think that's i really appreciate that i mean it's not like everybody's going to read it or, or read all the citations but to sort of feel that deeper confidence that someone has really put the legwork in and and you know um you know made a pretty categorical case it's just i think it's affirming to the overall community in the movement um and it's a it's a great track a great a great track for those who really want a deeper dive to dial in and i i would say you know i just it was a number of really really valuable insights for me in reading it um and being certainly well versed in the field um a lot of things that were put together very nicely so um, we have a number of, of questions here that have been, been popping up and we've got, we're about halfway through our time. So let me see if I can um, tease through them. Uh, Kim seems to have written a few questions. Um, I guess we'll just start off there. Uh, what can I do personally to help affect change? How can I be most impactful? What can we do to create awareness and education at all levels? Those are pretty grand, grand questions, but I mean, sometimes people have a little a, a well-developed pat response. Um, I say, I say, walk, walk your, your talk, be your, be your, follow your own guidance, and and make make the best of your, of your of your beinghood in all the ways you can. But yeah, that's not bad advice. Uh, there's, um, you know, on the personal level, there's sort of thinking about where you get your food and trying to essentially support farmers who are doing practices that are more regenerative. Uh, not everyone has has the ability to connect to them or access to them or and it can be difficult sort of knowing who is doing regenerative farming in one's area. But, you know, to the extent that one can ascertain that, um, that's one of the things that we've done in terms of, of food buying is trying to connect with farmers who we know what they're doing and, and source as much of our food as we can from them. Um, there's also in, in terms of like education, um, you know, and we're in the book writing uh, mode because that's what we do. Uh, and the goal there is to try and share information with people. So, you know, sharing books, uh, sending people books, you know, buy everyone in Congress our book, you know, that'd be wonderful if, if only they read. Um, <laughs> the, you know, so there's an education component. Or did based on what they read, yeah. <laughs> yeah, talk to people. Um, but there's also an advocacy in terms of, you know, the Farm Bill is up uh, this coming yeah. year. 
And, mm -hmm. you know, the timing of this book is good for trying to help get the word out that, hey, maybe we should think of agricultural policy as health policy and and think about how we incentivize and reward farmers for growing healthier, more nutritious food with more regenerative practices and agitate for among our elected representatives to actually support those kind of views um, uh, to the degree that they they, they can. <laughs> Um, so that there's lots of different sort of levels at which one could pitch stuff from the individual to, you know, trying to uh, reshape laws and incentives. Um, and it's, it's hard to give advice to know to any one individual where they should focus their efforts. Um, but, you know, our effort is focused, you know, primarily on awareness and education and trying to synthesize and put together those points so that other people can, you know, read about them, talk about them, share them, go out. You know, there's a great multiplier effect to sharing information. And so what we've done with the book is taken the first step of trying to put that out there in a way that's accessible. Because, you know, what you were saying, you know, someone could go and read all the thousand papers that we read to put this book together. I don't personally recommend it. It takes years uh, and most of them are really, frankly, quite boring. Um, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, we've tried to put it together in a more in a more user friendly way. Um, but that list is available, uh, should be up on our website soon in terms of if someone really wants to go read all that stuff, have at it. Yeah, yeah. And and I just want a point of um, uh, accuracy here. It, the, I was looking at it yesterday. The list of sources is actually, Dan, 56 pages. Okay. <laughs> but I'll stop. I think I, you I'm just repeating what David told me in, in a moment of just... Yeah, it feels like a hundred. It feels like a hundred, and I think that citations is still a whole bunch of citations. Yeah, it's still the, a whole actual, bunch. the actual yeah. number of citations I think is close to a thousand. That's where the, the, okay. the zeros came in, and um, okay. yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, I know this. The question reminded me of something, um, and that is that, and you referenced sort of you know the growing, emerging you know movement around soil health and agriculture and all these connections that we're talking about. It would be my personal hope that, um, I, I guess what I would call all farming systems, whether whether you wanna call it conventional or organic or everything in between, I would really like to see all of agriculture move toward Kind of a, I, I guess what I would call an outcome-based sort of way of thinking yep. about things. Yeah. Like take a look at the National Organic Program, and a lot of it is around policing, in what I consider inputs. Like you can't add this thing to your soil, but you can do this. You know, you know the do's and don'ts sort of thing. I think farmers, uh, at least those that are still in business, you know, and and good at what they do, and, and this is. You know, and I want to say right here, you know, it all depends on what system a farmer is following, because um, there are those conventional farmers and they rely on all those things, you know, tillage, fertilizers, agrochemicals. Uh, but if you use all those things, you're not your outcome is not going to be uh, improving or maintaining soil health. That's part of what David and I know about from doing all of this work. But there are other things that conventional farmers can do in terms of tweaking those things to get to outcomes where the health of their soil is improving. Organic farmers can do that. Biodynamic farmers can do that. There's no farmer out there has perfect soil because every season is different. Rainfall is different. Uh, levels of organic matter are different. But I truly believe that every farmer can get to better soil health. And they all have a set of skills, knowledge. They're sitting in, you know, different regions in this country, different regions around the world. And yet there's all something, there's all tweaks that they can do to their practices that can be better for soil health. And, and I, you know, so I, I'd like to try to, you know, sort of cast the umbrella and the tent writ large on agriculture and farming to emphasize soil health as an outcome of the practices as opposed to prescribing, here's the practices you're gonna do. Because yeah. we already know just in the United States, what's done in California is not what's done in Connecticut, right? Yeah. Just the rainfall 
uh, levels alone mean you're not going to be doing the same practices to get to soil health. And yet, farmers in both those places are figuring out how they can get to soil health with where they are and what they do and, you know, and what nature delivers. So that's applicable for a farmer on their, on their land, but also applicable for a human for their body or their family or whatever it is, right? It's about taking where you're at and, and, and continuing forward, you know, thoughtfully and systemically, I think is a broad answer to the question. Um, but we all have our own, you know, you guys are book writers and, you know, I run an organization, we've all got our calling, we've all got our thing that we like we're good at and are passionate about and where our energy comes from within that like feeds us. And so that's what I say to people is, what is it that inspires you? What is it that you, you feel called to do? And also, you know, um, eat food that <laughs> will make you be will make you well. Like, I, th I think it's one of the most important things we can do is simply feed ourselves well and if we're responsible for other people, be responsible for them eating well as well, because you only get good food through an environmental process that is beneficial for the environment. And the effect of that good food is you are more vigorous and vital and vibrant and have more capacity to be a benefit. Um, so, but anyway, um, all right, we're moving on here. Um, let me see, I need a Morgan. This is a simple a question, but probably with no answer. Where can we purchase nutrient, de nutrient dense foods? I would say, what is nutrient density? We don't even have a definition for it yet. So how can you know where to purchase them? <laughs> and it's a continuum, not a black and white. Right. So, right. but I don't know what you guys would say. Um, well, I guess I would say that there's basically two ways to think about that. One would be to think about what you eat in the sense of, you know, buy less processed food, um, more yeah. whole foods will be more nutrient dense on average. Yes. Um, but also then think about, you know, how they are actually grown. If you're looking at, you know, the simple distinction between, say, organic and conventional, odds are the organic produce will have higher phytochemical levels. You know, that was one of the takeaways that we took from the, we reviewed like all the papers we could find that did comparisons yeah. of organic and conventional food, which is not the same as soil health uh, comparisons, because there's plenty of organic farms that have degraded the soil and there's plenty of conventional farms that actually have pretty decent soil. Um, it all depends on what they're actually doing. Um, but one of the key takeaways from the, the broad you know, survey of studies was that the organically raised foods tend to have more phytochemicals. And we go into and antioxidants, anti-inflammatories, things that on average tend out to be fairly good for maintaining health in us. Um, it, the, so there's that choice that one can make in the marketplace. And the next level is to try and actually find out and understand what the farmers you're buying produce from are actually doing to their land. And that's most readily ascertained at farmers markets um, and where you can actually talk to the farmers or the people who work with and for the farmers and find out what do you do? You know, are you, are you, are you using regenerative practices or not? Um, and the highest level would be you could actually go out and start testing food and figuring out, you know, where is the new nutrient dense food in your community? That's a higher level of, of effort than most consumers are going to have uh, the um, willingness or access to the technology to actually do, at least for the moment. And most of us don't have, who are buying food, don't have access to a farmer's market where we can talk to the farmers for all the food that we're purchasing. But in yeah. most cases, you may be able to talk to a grower about a couple of things if you know what questions to ask. But the vast majority of your diet probably is not coming from a place where you can have that direct communication. So then what do you do? Um, yeah, no, I think we don't have the answer totally there yet. Yeah. But um, Well, I, I th the big picture answer is that we reform agriculture so that the standard style of agriculture is to produce nutrient dense food because then yeah. the problem goes away. So, but that's a multi-decade <laughs> challenge that we're all working on. Right. And that's, yeah. And that's partly why I like approaching this from an outcome based thing because yeah. you could buy conventional or organic but if the outcome on a particular farm is soil health is improving every year and reaching you know a, a level where there's you know there's not a standard for like what's the best <laughs> soil health but it's improving and farmers are maintaining it we wouldn't be having all of these crazy certification programs and farmers yeah. and fraud who are trying to get around these certification programs because if soil health is the goal, as opposed to, um, well, anyway, if soil health is the goal, that's how we can get to improving the nutrient 
density of food because of all of these um, things that we've been talking about for the last hour um, in terms of how these nutrients and different compounds are getting into uh, the plant and animal foods in the human diet. That's that's ultimately kind of how I see fixing and getting this where we all want it. An outcome-based assessment protocol uh, by, by whatever, whatever that looks like, however it happens. Right. That's what we've been saying for years and trying to start having the conversation about what that looks like. I don't, I don't think we have the answer yet, but I, I do feel really excited at this point in time with all the partners at the table coming together around that conversation and saying, okay, at least this is something we can agree on needing to be done. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. let's, let's yeah. work on that. Not a binary thou art or thou are, but like it's a continuum and um, it's based on the results, not on the, on the practices. That's been one of my, yeah. And, and I like to think about the progress in this conversation over the last 10 or 20 years that we've seen where yeah. 20 years ago, if you were talking about, you know, farming and soil health and nutrient density, it was hard to get people to listen. And now there's a lot of interest. It wasn't interest. even a term for nutrient density 10, 12, 15 years ago. We didn't have a word for it. It was literally was not, I mean, that's when I started. It was like, what about this thing where nutrients, where some carrots are better than others? And be like, there's not a word, there was, there was not a word for that concept. So the fact that we're this far along, you know, I feel like it's taken forever, but. It, but, but, you yeah. know, but it's progress. It's progress. Yeah. You have a whole hundred years for it if you do it well. Progress is slow. <laughs> you can watch something happen. <laughs> And I, I noticed there was a comment from Kim in the Q and A about yes. uh, uh, whether we'll be promoting our, the book locally in farmers markets and so forth in Seattle. And by that, I'm taking uh, that perhaps she is in Seattle. And I just yes. wanted to mention that we're actually doing the book kickoff in yes. Seattle next Tuesday night, um, Tuesday the 21st at 7:30 p.m. at Town Hall, Seattle. And if any of you out there are in Seattle or in the Northwest, we'd love to see you there and talk to you in person. It's been way too long since we've done stuff in person. Yeah, and actually, Dave, I think that the I think the talk may be virtual, too. Oh, it's also yes, it's also virtual. I think it is. Yeah. So yeah, so you just go to Town Hall Seattle, and um, they're a great organization. Tickets are I, I somewhere think, between five and ten. No, they're, they're they're I think tickets are five bucks. Five bucks. Uh, I don't know what the if that's the same for the virtual ones, but that's a talk where yeah. we'll actually you know present some of the data that we compiled because we did a little nutrient density study across the US we got nowhere near the kind of sample sizes that you're dealing with Dan but we, it was a very small but you got it published and we haven't done that yet so yeah, yeah. it was a very small very <laughs> focused assessment we did get it published yeah. um, but it's you know we'll show some of the data from that and talk more in more detail about some of these connections if anyone's interested in uh, in checking that out please join us Beautiful. And that's something else people can do is tell their friends about this event. Um, yeah, great. All right. Um, so uh, Nicole has a question. Uh, what advice do you have for a family who just moved to a new piece of land and want a garden slash some permaculture elements added later? But to get started, growing food ASAP in an annual garden, till or no till, zone five? Yeah, that, so we, get, we get questions like this. Um, um, quite a bit. And I would say, uh, get going because growing season is upon us now. <laughs> and Until we and, start. <laughs> yeah. So what to plant right away? I'd start with like really, you know, fast growing stuff like some. I think the question is, you've got sod right now. How do you convert? Their question was, do you want to, should they till to get started or not till to get started? It, it may depend a bit on the nature of the soil underneath. When when we bought our, our place in North Seattle that, that we wrote about in the Hidden Half of Nature, uh, it came pretty much with a with an old growth lawn, six inches of tangled roots. We pulled that off. The soil was terrible. Um, you know, it might have been a good idea to basically till that up to start. Um, we went a different route in terms of just composting and mulching and effectively doing no till, and it worked really great over the long run. Yeah. But if you have really very compacted, terrible soil, it might make sense to to disturb it a bit to start and then don't do that again <laughs> um but you know basically getting it so that the mineral matter is prepped to receive organic matter and that there's you know pore spaces and whole and, and, and the opportunities for life to process it um is a big one but yeah if you're going to do disturbance you know do it at the start and then back off and let the biology take over and it's context dependent Right, yeah. which is one of these things that there was there were like five rules to regenerative, and now there's a sixth rule, which is context. So thou shalt keep thine soil covered, thou shalt disturb the soil as little as possible, thou shalt, 
maintain polycultures, thou shalt ingrid in context. Right. So I think it's a, it's a, I mean, on my farm when I started, it was tight, hard, light colored, no, nothing. And I, I, I put a bunch of minerals down and I tilled, made my beds, mulched, and didn't touch it. And I think that was very efficient because I was able to go from a light colored dirt to a dark colored soil in you know, a couple of months, see absolute, absolute meaningful changes in soil structure and activity because of that initial disturbance process, but it included strategic actions. Um, that a point about context is so important, Dan. I mean, that is yeah. so true. Um, yeah. And it's, you know, that's where if we think about the, the 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 really big context of agriculture as an as a way to essentially foster the biology that enhances the use we want to see out of the land which is to to, to grow food if we think about you know what what we would do to cultivate to foster that biology then we can start thinking about it as an ecological system in context and how to do it if we simply think of it as something to hold food up and hold for you know to prop food up as we apply the elements and fertilizers we want to grow food that then the whole context thing goes out the window because you have got a prescriptive method that's not going to work in every context so what you're saying is so important yeah i was going to agree with you <laughs> and, and, and dan there's one question up here from um eric martin and he's asking, aaron she he, he, yes oh sorry aaron yeah, yeah, my on. class is on aaron and she they they are asking about um these questions from colleagues that are saying, well, how do you know that this regen stuff is better? And especially, it sounds like Aaron's working in a prescription food program. She's doing some really good work down in, yeah. in Oklahoma. Yeah, great work. Yeah, and so my response to all of that is that what we know about uh, plants and animals that are raised where soil quality is better and soil health is higher is that we're getting, um, more phytochemicals into our plants and phytochemicals are known to benefit human health you know we're not yeah. running and we never will get to the point of of like randomized controlled trials right that we can't we can't run a trial on this for 20 years and then tell everyone you need two carrots a day one cucumber you know three apples and so on we're just that's not the way to think about this the way to person's think biology and microbiology and biochemistry and Genetics is different, right? It yeah. can't be, yes, prescriptive. You cannot for standardize it, but you want to have foods in the diet suffused with phytochemicals, fibers, not processing our foods and, you know, tossing out minerals and vitamins. And so, in other words, it's setting up a diet where the body can use and have access to. Uh, all of the things that we know support human health. And in general, when you're not farming with a lot of tillage, a lot of fertilizers, and a lot of agrochemicals, you get foods that have higher levels of these things that are known to support human health. And, and that's, that's kind of the bottom line on, on, on all of this. And in terms of the comment from Aaron about um, you know knowing that eating more fruits and vegetables can lead to better health outcomes, because there have been studies that have looked at that, it's worth asking the question: Well, what is the underlying mechanism that people think is behind that? And that is essentially you know higher levels of of antioxidants, anti-inflammatories, phytochemicals, and so therefore, if you can show that regenerative produce has higher levels of those things, you could anticipate that there would be an enhanced been a beneficial effect from eating those things that had more of what we consider to be potentially the active mechanism. Now, of course, that's not the same as demonstrating it with a double blind clinical trial. And if someday those studies are done, great, let, you know, let's see where that goes. Um, but there's lots of things that go into affecting the outcome of those studies. And we haven't seen any of those studies done on regenerative produce so far. Um, you know, the one study we have seen done is the one that we did where we just looked at whether farming practices that were regenerative produced higher levels of those. And what we saw was a comparable di difference um, relative to the, the difference between organic and conventional in terms of, a you know, 20 to 25 percent higher, higher levels of, um, of phytochemicals, um, you know, uh, phytosterols, uh, total carotenoids and uh, total polyphenols, I think, were what we yeah. looked at. Um, so there's there's suggestions of a connection but you know to be able to actually prove the connection 
you're trying, you're getting sort of the difference between um, what I like to think of, of a common sense extrapolation of the science that we know in the direction that it's pointing, what's healthier, as opposed to demonstrating what the magnitude of that effect is in a population at large, um, which is a much higher burden of proof. That was a bit of a scientifically complicated statement, but those who followed it, followed it. Sorry, that's what I, I do. <laughs> no, I, I remember when I was reading the part about, about um, Lady Eve Balfour and her farm and the animals and like everybody knew that the animals that she was raising over here were better. They wanted, if they were going to get <laughs> calves or, or laying hens, this is the ones they wanted, right? I mean, there's that common sense thing, like it's just true. And then there's, can you really, really prove it? And so I think that's what you were trying to say. Um, yep. yep. And in yeah. fact, it, it's kind of like the way back in the 1940s when people were lending you money to buy a farm, the bank wanted to know what the soil organic matter level was because that told them about the fertility of the farm. Yeah. That doesn't happen anymore. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> All right. I'm, I'm got, we got a bunch of open questions, which is great. I'm going to try to see if we can move through some of them faster. Um, uh, Tom's question here, uh, hydroponic. Uh, have you considered hydroponic? How good or bad? Are they in nutrition? Um, are these systems improving? Maybe he means to say. Do you guys have any comments on hydroponic? We, you know, that's an area that frankly needs more research um, because there has not been much done on it. And, um, you know, what what's known somewhat about hydroponics is so here you Dave had talked before. You know, when you consider soil or let's say a, a vessel holding water as sort of a medium into which you pour other things for the plant to take in. Uh, that, that's one way of growing things. But what we don't know about hydroponics is how much of that is interfering with a plant's, uh, not interfering with, but let's just say um, influencing. To what degree does that influence the phytochemical profile of say strawberries or lettuce versus growing that same you know cultivar in uh, in soil that's got a lot of organic matter a lot of life you know that has high soil health that's the research and the experiment that we really need to be able to answer the question about our hydroponics you know what is the deal with hydroponics we don't we don't totally know and I suspect that that varies uh that varies too with um <clears throat> with, from crop to crop because there's some like take watercress right this is a semi or totally aquatic plant and so if you're growing something that normally grows aquatically then you know maybe that's that's an appropriate crop to try and produce hydroponically um but as for the other stuff I'm not sure we have all the if we, if we understand that it's the microbiome that's foundational in the, you know, process of building the nutrients into the plant, and you're engaging in a process of growing a plant without a microbiome, or at least without one that it evolved with, I mean, we can hypothesize at this point, can't we, about the likelihoods? Yeah, yeah. and it's, it's not that a hydroponic plant lacks a microbiome it's that that hydroponic plant has a really different microbiome, different than, microbiome than the one it evolved with and the one growing it's, in the soil everything has a microbiome you yep. can't get outside of reality <laughs> life is the reality right yeah. and there's and there's the the reality that in a hydroponic system the whoever's operating it you know can add whatever they want in a soluble form that the plant will then take up the question is you know will they add be able to figure out and add the full complement of things that we might want in that food or are they going to be growing you know like lettuce that is lacking in phytochemicals and mineral micronutrients because they focused on high yields and didn't add the little bit of zinc or the little bit of copper or whatever that might actually benefit us in our diet as a micronutrient uh, yeah. That's basically back to the problem of conventional agriculture and what happened to wheat, corn, and rice, the three big human staples these days, in terms of crop breeding and then uh, you know breeding for for yield in high nitrogen environments, which reduced the mineral micronutrient content inadvertently. Yeah. All right. I see a good one here from Eva, who is I think in the Netherlands. Um, um, my question is, how can we best start integrating nutrient density and soil health? in existing and new planetary accounting schemes? And what is, in your opinion, the biggest challenge? I guess that we'd be talking about um, ecological verification, you know, ecological market credits, carbon credits, 
how do we integrate nutrient density and soil health into that? And um, we know the, the, the simplest way is to be thinking about the carbon content of soil because it's simple to measure. It, people argue about how to measure it, and, and there's lots of different ways to do it, but you can do it in an oven at home. It's, you know, it's theoretically pretty simple to do, um, and it translates fairly well into assessments of soil health um, if you account for you know, the climate in the region that you're in. You know, a 3% organic matter soil might be pretty good in some parts of the tropics or the semi-arid areas, but it's going to be horrible in Iowa um, in terms of the potential that one could have there. Um, but, you know, in terms of planetary accounting, um, you know, looking at the amount of carbon we actually have in the soil is a pretty good first order assessment. Um, in terms of nutrient density, it's a lot harder. In context. But carbon within context, you're saying, is a great yes. biomarker. Yeah, that, that context thing is, is again, yeah. super important. Yeah. Um, because, you know, if you, if you gauge soil health on a particular number of a carbon content, and then you go, you know, it's going to be have a different real implication as to whether you're in the Southwest or in um, or in New England, for example. Um, so context is really everything. For nutrient density, it's harder to see how to devise a simple metric to get it into global accounting. Um, but I think that one way to look at it would be to look at essentially the average, um, say, like micronutrient deficiency in the human diet globally. We know that there's major zinc deficiencies globally. It's only like 40% of the population, if I'm remembering the numbers right, at a global level is deficient in zinc. You know, we could basically aim to get that number to zero uh, to, so that everyone has an adequate mineral micronutrient um, composition. Uh, when we get to things like phytochemicals, you know, it's really less certain about how enough, how much is enough. And I think my perspective from working on this book with Ann is that, you know, we need to basically have a steady supply of a decent amount of phytochemicals in our diet, antioxidants and anti-inflammatories in particular. Um, and it may be more important to have that as a regular input in our foods rather than having super high levels in some foods. Yeah. Um, and so that, you know, having essentially a stand. A, 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 uh, yeah, I guess I'd, yeah, I'd consider it like um, you want a nice steady drip of a diversity of phytochemicals in your diet throughout, throughout life, right? So that's where, wow, all of a sudden cranberry, that's what I need. I'm going to go take 5,000 right. milligrams of uh, the anthocyanin <laughs> yeah. that are in cranberries. That's not the way... Turmeric, turmeric, turmeric. Ginger. Want, yeah, you want that nice, steady, that nice, yeah. steady drip into your body. You know, every single day. That's, and that makes. That's sense. what we want for ourselves. But I mean, I I happen to know who Ava is and what she does. So I think the point that she was asking, you're not answering, which oh. is how do we take this understanding and integrate it into evolving our future schemes globally for monitoring and metricing and affirming, you know, all the work that's being done on, on the carbon markets and, you know, the ecosystem services markets as, as examples, I think her question was, do you have any suggestions about ways that um, this understanding about nutrient density, et cetera, soil health can be yeah. integrated into that context, into that sort of global yeah. conversation and framework? I think you're working up simple, simple metrics of soil health. Um, and of which the absolute simplest is carbon content. It's probably a little too simple. You want something that also looks at microbial activity and abundance mm -hmm. and diversity. Um, and, and Anne has talked about something that they called sort of a, like a index of soil, what, index of biotic integrity for yeah. the soil. Um, it hasn't, I don't think it has been uh, you know, laid out yet, but I think there's a way to think, to conceptualize uh, how to do that as sort of a common foundation for thinking about if if we're enhancing the health and fertility of the soil, building its carbon content, building the beneficial uh, uh, life in it, and building the microbial activity along with the carbon content, um, yeah. that basically the nutrient density part of it at that, that global scales will come along for the ride. Yeah. yeah. So but the question yeah. is, how do you establish a market or a, a structure to incentivize those outcomes what would be well, a strategy to incentivize right. outcomes? and that's where i think um <laughs> that's where you start st start to need i think uh larger structures in place to incentivize 
and um, make sure that that's going to work and that it's running smoothly. And that's where I think government programs can play a role because um, I just think about in the U.S. we have um, these various programs that come through the farm bill. It's, one is women, uh, WIC, women, infants, and children. And this is, yeah. this is a big driver on what um, low income folks are able to purchase. And, and other, other programs that can incentivize the production of the kinds of foods that we want to see in the human diet at the same time that it's incentivizing, you know, the purchase and acquisition of those foods is somehow marrying that. I mean, it's a really good question. And if the answer were easy, then Eva would not be asking us. She's, um, she's very intelligent and working with various universities and good organizations in Europe. I can yeah, I can that. I, I and do, all of us don't really have a good answer either. So. Yeah, and I, I do think Dave's right though. And that's where, um, to the extent that we can be setting up sort of biological, physical, chemical, the natural processes in agriculture and in soil, then the rest of the stuff that we want will come along as, as quote, you know, baggage, but it's good baggage. It's really, really, it's, you know, it's the gold of baggage that we want. So that when soil- the happens, bottom line, It's all the things we want to occur will occur. Right. If that's occurring. If the microbes, right. if the microbes are happy, everything's in place, right? That's <laughs> right. So. <laughs> Put it this way, with soil health comes um, a vast silver lining, everything from helping to address climate change to uh, pushing back on, you know, chronic disease rates and incidents in the human population to reinvigorating rural communities. There's, there's, there's a lot to the silver lining of soil health so that if we set that, then all of these other things ripple right on out of it. I think a lot of people have come to that conclusion that's something we agree that we want. The question is really, you know, how do we set up the structures to facilitate that end, end game? But let's, we've got 10 questions left and, and 10 minutes left. So okay, well, we'll let, me, can... let me offer one sort of clarification. There's a number of questions and comments that have still flowed in about the hydroponics issue. Yeah. Um, we're not advocating growing food hydroponically, <laughs> um, you know, for all the reasons that we've been discussing here. But there is one there's sort of one circumstance where I think it may actually be a very good idea. And that's space travel. <laughs> not now. Let's just be clear. We're not advocating hydroponic production of. Are you advocating space travel? <laughs> no, nor are we advocating. Well, well, for certain people sent to certain destinations, okay, okay, I okay. can get behind it. <laughs> all right. I got this one from Mark. I wanted to make sure I got in. Um, if all of your books raised questions that led to the next book, what questions came up from writing this book? You know, I think one of the really big eye openers to me um, in writing this book was just how rich uh, the literature on the biomedical effects of phytochemicals and sort of plant made compounds actually are. And, and I've talked a bit about maybe going further with that down the road. Um, say that but, in English. Say that in English for those who are still tracking. <laughs> um, essentially, looking at the, how the way that uh, antioxidants, anti-inflammatories, things like beta carotene, things like lycopene and tomatoes, how those kinds of natural compounds actually interface with our health when they come into our diet. Um, you know, that was a real eye opener in terms of researching the back half of this book, and I think there's more that could be done in looking at that and looking at how we've long looked at the botanical world as sources of medicines and how to, not, how to think about that now going forward, uh, where we can think about regenerative agriculture as sort of combining some of the ancient wisdom of crop, cover crops and crop rotations and traditional practices that have been used in various parts of the world with, with some modern science that allows us to do this in no-till fashions and to um, do precision applications of things thinking about that similar kind of pairing of traditional wisdom and modern science in phytochemicals is something I think could be a very interesting question to look at. Um, but I'm sure Anne has her own. Uh, well, let, let's hear Anne's in a second, but let me just, let me parse that out for, for a minute because I do want to hear Anne's. Um, so basically what you're saying, if I, I'll try to translate because I think I've been doing this long enough to know that when I start using words like phytochemicals and antioxidants, people, they just don't quite connect. So what you're talking about is basically flavor and aroma, those things which 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 we experience viscerally and intensely in what 
was traditionally called, you know, herbal medicine, right? So the mint of the mint or the basil of the basil or whatever it is, actually it's the tomato of the tomato or the carrot of the carrot that what you're saying you found very intriguing was those compounds that correlate with that flavor and aroma, whether it's a medicinal plant, quote unquote, or a fruit or vegetable, quote unquote, how that connects to you getting better. Is that what I heard you say? That like, it's really quite impressive how those things connect to positive health effects. That was one of the things that really came into focus that I had not anticipated in the book is how okay. many of the sort of flavor cues we get from whole natural foods, sort of taking processed foods off the table for a moment because the they're junk. Food. That's they're all junk, all not food. different. Um, they're called them junk. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, where they're the flavor profile in whole natural foods is related to many of these compounds that then have demonstrated um, you know, positive health effects in the human population um yeah. it's a very it's very interesting and you know and the biologist was all over like you know this is about evolution it's how you know how we evolved to understand <laughs> what we're eating and to how to guide ourselves how our bodies guide ourselves to a nutritious diet in a natural environment and one of the things that you know food processing has done um and i'm guilty of liking many processed foods uh, i'm not eating as many as i used to but you know some of them are pretty tasty but that connection between flavor and health has been broken by breaking foods down into their ingredients and remixing them in ways where the flavors no longer provide clues to what's actually in the food. They just provide flavors. Yeah. I, yeah. One area I'm interested in is how, um, I think one thing I've been surprised and not surprised by about, you know, coming to the end of the research and the writing of this book is, uh, the role of variability in life and how that is illicit you know anyone trying to build standards as you full know, yes. know Dan, mm -hmm. anyone trying to build standards or um trying to get blinders or curbs on something so that we can know this thing or that thing that it just you know in some respects um we're just that's almost impossible because without variability, um, evolution in life would not be happening. And so I've come to embrace variability and diversity in a way that I didn't, I think, fully appreciate when this book started. Because if, I mean, I think about this in, in the context of COVID, and it's still remarkable to me after a couple of years, how variable a person's response is to becoming, to, to get, having that virus. Some people yeah. are completely asymptomatic and some people are dead. And those are the two, and there's everything in between. And what- And I'm most really, people look at both of them at that time and said they were healthy. Yeah. Right? Right. This person was really healthy and then this happened and- Right. Yeah. And so what is the role of, how do we use this variability and diversity in, in our, um, in our crops, in our animals, and in our own bodies and biology, so that <clears throat> health is optimized in all of those places to the degree that we can, you know, try and get there. And so it, it's really, it's a tough nut to crack because science doesn't like trying to, you know, parse through and figure out variability and diversity because you can't come to any one answer, which goes, which goes, <clears throat> goes to your point, Dan, about context is everything. Relationship is everything. And, and so I'm interested in trying to explore that and express it in a way so that people can sort of better understand, oh, how could I apply this in um, the food choices that I'm making and where I buy my food or even, uh, you know, some some people thrive on running marathons and some people thrive on walking, you know, a half a mile or a mile every day. And those are just differences in all of us. So somehow, um, you know, talking about that in a way that uh, people will realize that our bodies are really different and need, you know, completely different things over the course of our um, life history. And of course, I'm always enamored with the botanical world and this whole question of um, where did medicines 
come from and how much look how drastically they've changed this is right this is the big sort of battle if you will or difference between herbal medicine and standard pharmaceuticals you can standardize pharmaceuticals but if you're going out and you're you know harvesting echinacea and trying to make tinctures and so on with that every every plant is different but it also explains why there's all of these drug reactions right people are on different prescriptions and different pharmaceuticals and for some people it's like wow bingo great it really addressed that thing i had other people are like i got sick as a dog and yeah. i cannot take that drug anymore so this is this is an interesting area of the human body interacting with nature and standards very very intriguing and i like both those answers uh we we we, we only have three minutes left other i see you david it looks like looking at the screen and maybe are there any other questions that you've seen pop up that you would like to answer or and either of you if you've been paying attention i've sort of been managing the chat but um <laughs> yeah there's something entirely. yeah so. just one thing a person makes a good point here i believe it may be tom um tom willie from california well there was somebody who was asking about um crop varieties and breeding for yield and so on and and one of the the points we make in the book and when you look at these various agronomic studies the kind of research that it would be really great if usda would do is breeding for crops that do uh well in organic matter rich microbiota rich that would be a big um, deal <laughs> kind of an environment we want plants to be bred for communication with their that would be an amazing bio. tactical thing to aim for is just make the varieties that are available you know ones that work well with nature like work that well with shouldn't be nature. too big of a hurdle but would massively impact things right. i mean the way i see it you've got the yeah. green the green body of a plant and its communication potential with yeah. soil microbiota and given the vast array of compounds and metabolites that come out of soil microbiota, what if a plant were, it's sort of, you know, the difference between speaking one language and 300 languages. Right now, I think too many crops are the equivalent of just being able to speak one language with the soil microbiota. And that, that cuts off and cuts down on the conversation and the symbioses and the synergies. And if we bred our crops, to have you know a broader, wider, more in-depth conversation with the soil microbiota, that to me would be another really interesting, um, interesting Beautiful. way for agriculture to yeah. proceed. I love that point. I love that point. I just, just this has been great. Obviously, we could keep going for a while, but I'm guessing people have lives to go back to. Before we end, the name of the book, where people can purchase it. Um, this is we we're doing this to help get the word out of all the wonderful work you've done. So um, um, the, the book, the new book is called What Your Food Ate. Uh, yeah. and it can be purchased uh, probably anywhere that one normally buys books, whether you're local independent bookstore or Amazon or other giant online retailers should should have access to it. Uh, it's officially published next Tuesday, but, you know, it's orderable today. You just they won't yeah. ship it until Tuesday. Um, yeah. That's uh you know, uh, you can also, if people are interested, check out our website, which is dig2grow.com, dig the number two grow.com. Um, and you know, there's a little descriptions of the various books there. If you want signed copies, you can like email us there. We can figure out a way to get them to you. Um, but or people have to come speak at their conference or things like that. Yeah, or we do, we do public speaking. We'll speak at conferences. Um, uh, all those kind of things. Uh, and if you want to just uh, email us and communicate with us through the website, that gets forwarded to us as well. Um, and we're always happy to engage with readers. Um, the, uh, um, yeah, it's been fun working on this book. It took a few years longer than I think either one of us thought that it would um, because there's just so much to dig through and wade through. But, you know, we found an awful lot of material out there that's relevant to these connections going from soil health to human health. It's just been chopped up in different disciplines and different silos and really hasn't been synthesized uh, really since the 1940s, I think, when people like Howard and Balfour and Rodale were talking about these connections from a more intuitive perspective. 
a lot of science has been filled in to connect those little beads on that string all the way along. Um, and it's going to be very complicated to, you know, be able to confidently assert that, yes, doing this to the soil will affect this to human health. But the directionality and the connections and the pathways we think are fairly clear. Um, that's what we tried to capture in the book. Right. Yeah, that's that's my whole argument. We need evidence based agriculture. And so, you know, in putting these links together, that that is where we would really like to see um, farming and agriculture and food you know, head into the future. So Dan, thank you so much. Um, really appreciate Bionutrient and the kind of audiences that you guys pull together and garner. It's, it's such a service and um, greatly appreciated. Well, um, from one to another, thank you all both for your great work and uh, <laughs> labor of love and hope it succeeds uh, very much. It's, it's, uh, it's, I think it's really important, important work. And so I'm, I'm happy to Put my shoulder behind and getting it further out there. Great. So okay. Great, thank you. All right. Thank you very much. All right, everybody. Have a good weekend wherever you are. Yes. <laughs>